In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about recursive queries, indexing, analytical workloads using GPUs, massive streams of data, and multiple forms of replication. I'm Creston Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, Episode 2. All right, the first article is Indexing with Postgres When Less is More. This is on medium.com, part of Plan Grid Technology. And so this post goes into a query that was running slower than anticipated. Um, they use Python and they were they use SQL Alchemy as their ORM. And they had a query when they ran explain analyze, it was running in 1.8 seconds. Uh, and this was slower than they felt it should be given the amount of data that they were pulling. What's interesting about this article, it goes into depth how Postgres works to retrieve your uh, result set in terms of uh, doing index scans to retrieve the data, uh, potentially recheck conditions, as well as doing bit bitmap heap scans to actually pull the data from, from disk. And he goes into how some things were happen happening that he didn't quite expect. Basically, he had to go over his query again and really thinking about how he was pulling the data and what he needed to do uh, to make it more efficient. And even said he did some um, experimentation as well. But doing that experimentation with the query and taking a look at the explain plan and the performance, he was able to make the query uh, much more efficient. Like before, he was using two columns to do a join to the table that he was interested in. Uh, but he just realized that he was able to filter it down to one and make the query much more efficient. So he goes from, I believe it was 1.8 seconds down to 23 milliseconds. So definitely a, a big win. So some of the points he covers here is that when you're having a performance problem, you definitely want to be testing out assumptions on a production-like database. Uh, because Postgres takes into account table size, cardinality of the data, resources available, all of those come into play when it's determining the best route to take to process a query as efficiently as possible. And even though he says um, at the end, less is more isn't an axiom you can live by, but measure twice, cut once is. So basically, with you, when you have queries that are slow, you definitely need to test them against production data to assure that they're as optimized as they can possibly be. The next starter we're going to look at is from the nextplatform.com, and it's called Bringing GPUs to Bear on Bog Standard Relational Databases. This isn't explicitly about Postgres or doesn't ex explain how it works, but it brings something to the forefront that I, I think more people need to, to think about and be aware of. And they're talking about the separation between operations uh, and operations that need to be in terms of transactional databases and then analytical databases. Uh, historically, you have online transaction processing, OLTP, and uh, online analytical processing. And typically, they were two different um, workloads. So you would have your transaction process processing a database is very efficient in processing transactions as fast as possible, inserts, updates, selects, uh, deletes. Whereas your analytical database is tailored for workloads where you're analyzing a lot of data, maybe doing a lot of joins, and it's okay for queries to run longer, but you ha usually had less users processing those queries. So that separation is still in effect today. You know, they make a quote here, every company, even Google, and so this is a quote, Every company, even Google and Facebook, has this split between transaction, excuse me, transaction processing and warehousing. And the, another quote, the split is not going away anytime soon. So it's basically this recognition that this has to happen. What I've seen in, in some clients is that they use the one database um, for everything. And at times they, they get into problems doing a lot of analytical, even customer uh, demand of things uh, to process analytics. And sometimes it's best to separate separate that off into a separate database or even process um, uh, summaries or aggregate tables in a database to be able to handle those queries very fast as opposed to um, trying to process and read across millions of rows at a time. 
So it's just something to keep in mind. The other interesting thing about this article is it goes into people looking at using GPU processing capacity to do massively parallel operations like you would do in an analytical type database. And interestingly, many of the vendors that they're mentioning here have Postgres SQL as the core engine that does these uh, massively parallel uh, queries. So I thought this was a very good article to check out. Again, it's not necessarily educational in terms of teaching you something, but it gives a broad view of the state of using massively parallel analytical databases as well as their future potential with GPUs. Okay, the next article we're going to look at is uh, from medium.com again from Alibaba Tech. Uh, how to create a stream system with tens of millions of feeds. Um, so this is a blog post from Alibaba, which I believe is essentially China's Google. But they go into how they're using Postgres, uh, and there's a diagram here, where they're streaming all of the data that's coming in into Postgres SQL instances. Uh, it then passes it off into a, a storage service, and then they're using this um, database system called Hybrid DB for Postgres SQL to actually do the analytical um, processing. So here again, this is an example of the separation from the transaction processing that's happening and the analytical processing that's happening. Now, if you're curious what, curious what Hybrid DB is, um, essentially they that is their own product uh, that they developed from Postgres SQL, and they I believe it's mentioned a little bit in this blog post, but they basically took the Greenplum database. I'm going to the Greenplum database site now. And this is an open source, massively parallel data platform. So they do this kind of analytical processing uh, and use Postgres SQL core as the engine. Now it's not uh, the up-to-date Postgres SQL. I believe they're targeting moving to um, version nine as the core relatively soon, um, but it is meant for very massively parallel processing of data. So basically, they took that Greenplum database and modified it for their own use case for developing this hybrid DB. So it goes into their uh, data ingestion process here. And in the, under the heading advantages of the scheme that they've come up with, uh, the number one thing they say is performance. So Postgres SQL's powerful concurrent write performance combines with hybrid DB's analytic performance. So a single um, Postgres SQL can support millions of writes and batches loaded into their um, hybrid DB analytic database. Now their hybrid, anal hybrid DB analytic database enables real-time millisecond level queries through uh, MPP's superior analytical performance. Uh, the other thing they mention is data handling and cleaning that their, their system, uh, had, that they've set up for their system, as well as some other benefits that they go into. So I thought this was a great article to look at to get, again, the perspective of how people are using Postgres, what it is uh, best for in terms of transactional processing. So I definitely encourage you to check out this article. And if you're interested in analytical processing, maybe check it, and you're interested in open source, maybe check out the Greenplum database site, which is greenplum.org. Okay, for the next article, this is a bit of a fun one. This is not necessarily related to scaling your database, but in terms of something of interest to developers in Postgres, I thought this was a fun article to take a look at because actually I am a weekend dungeon master. Uh, so this um, blog post is exporting a hierarchy in JSON with recursive queries. And this is from the site, uh, <laughs> T-A-P-O-U-E-H dot org. Uh, so there'll definitely be the link for, for uh, this link in the show notes that you can take a look at. Uh, but what was interesting is that they're using Dungeons & Dragons characters and using with recursive SQL in order to produce a JSON document out of or using SQL. So not necessarily related to scaling Postgres, but definitely a, a fun and interesting uh, article to take a look at. The next article we're going to take a look at is actually a YouTube video. So if you are interested in multi-master replication, there was a recent YouTube video that was posted uh, that, that I felt was very good. I watched uh, through the whole thing. Uh, the title is Geographically Distributed 
multi-master replication with PostgreSQL and BDR. And BDR is an acronym for bidirectional replication. So uh, n natively, Postgres does not have a facility for doing multi-master um, replication, but there are other solutions that are available from vendors that can do that for you. And this talk goes into um, kind of two different camps uh, that these solutions fall into. One is a tightly coupled relationship between the masters, and one is a loosely coupled relationship between the masters. So what they say in terms of tightly coupled is that uh, with tightly coupled, most things are local. So, so for example, your storage is uh, sharded or excuse me, shared typically. In terms of consistency and isolations, it tends to preserve the ACID uh, model. So a lot of applications can work with it fairly well. Uh, disadvantage is geographical distance. It doesn't really work that way to have your masters geographically separated because a lot of them work, uh, it works synchronously, particularly if it's shared storage, uh, transactions are happening in a synchronous fashion. In terms of data conflicts and collisions, they can be uh, prevented more easily. And the application com compatibility is pretty transparent. The other camp is loosely coupled. So this is where your storage is pretty much independent. So you've entirely separate databases with their own storage system and replication happens between them. Uh, so the storage is not shared. And it depends on eventual consistency. So in location A, some data gets updated and then B, it eventually ends up in location B. So geographically speaking, it's very good at handling that. It's not so great for consistency, of course. So you tend to have database conflicts and usually those these solutions rely on optimistic resolution to those uh, data conflicts. And the committing of transactions to the database are typically asynchronous because there's such a distance between uh, these solutions. Now this talk folk, excuse me, this talk focused more on BDR, which is a loosely coupled solution. And they like to think it a bit a little bit different using an acronym PACELC. So basically when things are connected, meaning the whole system is working, you have multiple masters and they're replicating data between one another. You can either choose to have latency between them being updated or consistent. But when you have a breakdown in your replication, so when it's partitioned, you can either choose from availability or consistency. If you choose consistency, it's probably only going to mean one of those masters is operating. Whereas if you choose available, probably multiple masters, if the link is broken, are still working, but now you're potentially in an inconsistent state. Another thing that was really great about this presentation is if you're going for a loosely coupled solution, he emphasized the need to do application changes. And he goes over how to handle conflicts. How are you going to handle keys? Um, is Are you going to use something like UUIDs, are you going to have a central key distribution for the keys on your tables? How are you going to handle schema changes? And definitely really emphasized the importance of testing. So if you're considering multi-master replication and you're using Postgres, I definitely suggest you check out this video. Okay, moving on to uh, something related to replication, I have the next article is from the Citus Data blog and it's three approaches to Postgres SQL replication and backup. So it talks about three approaches, although uh, reading it, I kind of felt more like it was approaches to replication and recovery. So the first solution is you have streaming replication between two Postgres databases. And if you wanna bring up a new node, essentially you have to start replicating data from the primary using streaming replication. And basically it has to stream that entire database over the wire to be able to set up replication as a new replica. The second level is where you're doing volume level replication uh, and you replicate at the storage layer. Now, this is not something that uh, Postgres SQL supplies natively, but this is a data storage solution to replication. The third approach is basically taking backups from your primary, including the wall files, then you restore that backup apply wall files until the replica is close to the primary, and then you start streaming. So the advantage of this approach is that you don't have to have the load on the master while rebuilding this new replica. 
So they don't explicitly show how to do this or don't have code examples. Um, but if you're thinking about different uh, techniques for bringing up replicas for your um, Postgres installation, I definitely suggest checking out this uh, article, article to see their discussion about it. The next article we're going to cover is Replication Topologies in Postgres SQL. And this is from the Ops, excuse me, Ops-blog. And basically this is a, a more basic post that kind of just goes over Postgres SQL replication uh, in general. And it presents how do you handle uh, do master slave? How do you do hot standbys? Uh, it talks about eventual consistency because generally when you're setting up a hot standby, it's um, asynchronous. It does not write to both synchronous in a synchronous way. But it also talks about some settings you can do to actually make them synchronize standbys. And it also talks a little bit about the uh, logical replication uh, that Postgres provides as well as cascading replication between uh, for your replicas. So if you're just getting started in replication, uh, this would be a good post to look at. Similarly, another post that was updated is uh, Postgres SQL replication slots by, again, by Opstash blog. And here they talk about uh, using replication slots. Uh, historically, you haven't needed to use replication slots to do replication, but this talks about uh, setting them up and how to uh, get them running for your replication setup. Now, the last piece of content we're going to take a look at is another uh, YouTube video. This is Postgres SQL replication in 2018. So again, going on this theme of replication, it goes through and talks about all the different replication options and things to look at. Um, so if you're looking at replication and thinking about changing the scheme you're using, uh, this is definitely a video to watch. Now, I will warn you that the audio of this presentation is not great. So just be aware of that as, as you're reviewing it. But definitely a piece of content to take to look at if you're looking into replication now. That does it for episode two of Scaling Postgres. Be sure to check out the links in the show notes to each article or piece of content that I mentioned. Be sure to head on over to scalingpostgres.com so that you can get weekly notifications of each episode, or you can feel free to subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.